chilling tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. As we enter the new year, give the gift of a better you to yourself. If you find yourself having seasonal blues, therapy might just give you the right tools you need to get the gift today. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash horror today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash horror. Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in, turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> <laughs> Good evening! You're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome, dear listeners, to Season 14, Episode 10. I'm your host, Otis Jiry, and in this episode, I'll be performing four tales to terrify you, courtesy of authors Kisto Healy, Dale Thompson, Nicole Exposito, and Kyle Harrison. Tonight, we'll hear stories of perplexing party growers. Spectral Sightings, Green Games, and Illuminating Inquiries. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first two spine-tingling stories. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now... It's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail. So, lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. <laughs> the show's about to begin. <laughs> a new year is upon us, and what better way to ring in that year with some stories, with some old friends and some new that we've met on this program during this season. Kissed O'Healy is not one to shy away from a party, and neither are the two we meet in this tale. There's nothing quite like finding the right person to share the new year with, especially when you just know exactly what you're looking for in life. Just hope the other person's on the same wavelength as you. Without further ado, I present to you a midnight kiss. Desmond didn't care for Christmas. In his opinion, it had become as hallmark as Valentine's Day. It was all by the it gift, wear red and sing the happy songs. He used to enjoy the fire in the tree, but even that had become boring to him. New Year's was a different story, though. He endured the Christmas cheer because he knew that a week later, the real excitement would happen. He developed a ritual. Every year, He'd find the best party in town, wear his best suit, and he would live. Desmond knew it was important to live, to experience, to enjoy. He'd done plenty of the opposite. He would party, dance, drink, mingle, and use the opportunity to find the right person. He didn't care what gender they were. 
That had no bearing on anything for him. He just wanted them to be compatible with him. Someone special and magical who'd be worth spending the rest of the year with. He'd kiss them when the ball dropped on all the TVs and everyone screamed and blew their noisemakers when the champagne cork flew. It would be wonderful and passionate. And then, from the first moment of the new year, they would be his, and they would enjoy and experience life and sensuality in all forms. That is, until the year was coming to a close. Then he would need more excitement, more sensation, and he'd have to send them away to find their own New Year's lover while he began his ritual again. Sometimes they didn't take it well, and sometimes they completely agreed and were as ready to replace him as he was to them. Whether they liked it or not, most understood that this was what was best for everyone. This was bigger than just the two of them and their one-year relationship. Desmond's current partner, a man named Jeremiah, had given him many good times over the past year. He would be missed more than most, but Desmond wasn't about to bend or break the rules now. There were his rules to live by. He created them himself. There was no point in fighting against them. Jeremiah deserved to make someone else just as happy as he made Desmond. Surely he would. Before him was a woman named Maxine. She was exciting in the bedroom, but too much of a homebody for Desmond's tastes. That wasn't living. He wanted to get out to dance the night away and laugh, big, hearty, true laughter, from deep down in your soul. Maxine preferred to sit on the couch and binge-watch Netflix. Desmond had no use for that and would leave her there to do what she wanted on her own. There were many before her, and there would be many more to come. He wondered who the next one would be. Tonight would answer that question, and he trembled with the anticipation of it. He licked his lips as he ironed his suit, swaying his hips to the very Christmas music that he hated. Today was the last day for it, though, and somehow that made it more appealing, partaking in something before it was gone. He found what was said to be the party of the century at a big hall in the East Village. It was generally a wedding venue, but somebody who had the money decided to rent it out for an enormous New Year's party with decorations and open bar and live music. Desmond couldn't wait. He could already imagine the kiss on his lips, the taste of a new person on his mouth. Soon, he thought, soon. Adelaide was nervous. She was new to the city and didn't know that that many people yet, but her co-worker at the record store, Laura, had insisted that New Year's was the best time to meet people. It didn't make a whole lot of sense to her. Why was the time when everyone was drunk or coked up the best time to meet new people? It seemed like a terrible time to her. Still, she knew that she had to do something. She couldn't just sit around in her apartment watching Breaking Bad from the beginning again, as amazing as that show was. Even if she didn't meet that special someone, Adelaide thought... It'd be good to dance and have a drink or twelve, to scream with everyone when the new year was upon them. It would be good to feel alive. It was very easy to feel the opposite when there was no one to share your day with, no one to cuddle up to, nowhere to go, nothing to see, and just the same four walls that seemed to be closing in on you the more you saw them. In her mind, she heard the crackle of fire. Adelaide flipped through the closet in search of the perfect dress to wear, something that didn't clash with her big, gaudy purse. Laura would be there to meet her soon. She had to be ready, or that girl would drag her out of this apartment by her wrist when she was still in her underwear. Of course, that brashness and carefree attitude was exactly why Adelaide thought Leslie was good for her. She smiled, thinking about it, and the smile went from her lips to her heart. She was beginning to feel excited about this New Year's event after all. Maybe she'd meet the one tonight. Adelaide twirled in a circle to the Christmas music blasting from her speakers. Happy New Year's, she said to the universe with a giggle. Desmond didn't want to get a taxi or an Uber, not when he was wearing his freshly pressed finest suit. He knew how people treated the interior of those vehicles. It wasn't there, so they felt no need to respect the leather. 
They got in drunk, threw up, shot up, fornicated. There was no way in hell that any piece of this suit was going to touch some drunk fool's love juices. In fact, he decided that was his resolution, to treat his suits like he did his annual partners. Desmond ordered a limo and sighed with contentment when he got in and smelled the freshly clean carpet and seating. It smelled like pine. A little late, he said to himself with a laugh. Christmas tree season was officially over. He bought himself a glass of champagne. It was sitting in a bucket of ice waiting for him. There's no reason not to partake. Today was a celebration, after all. It was a new beginning. He felt sad to cut Jeremiah loose, and worse that he had to do it early. But the man wanted to meet his own new partner in a different city far from here. He had to leave days before their official end, or he wouldn't be there in time to find a party to bring in the new year. It wouldn't be fair for him to not allow Jeremiah the same ritual he partook in. That was his way. Don't forget to live, Desmond has said to him. Enjoy. Experience. Of course, Jeremiah said back with a smile before heading out the door. Those were the last words they would ever speak to each other, unless the world changed and they found themselves at war. In that case, they'd be forced to reunite. All of Desmond's past conquests would have to come together then. But that was only a possible future, not an eventuality. Something that Desmond was building towards, just in case. For now, they were all free to live, lust, and create alliances. Here, Desmond said to the driver. Oh, thank you. Adelaide was still working on her makeup in the drop-down mirror above the passenger seat in Laura's car. You look fine, Laura said without actually looking at her. I'm just nervous. I know. Stop it. Oh, okay. Because it's just that simple. Laura sighed her frustration. All right. Let's take your mind off it. Tell me what brought you to the big city. I still don't know. I mean, you're not a college student, and you didn't get the job with me until after you were already here, so what was it? What brought you? Trauma, I guess. Wow, okay. So, please don't say that to the guys at the party. What do you mean by trauma? I lost my house in a fire. My parents were asleep inside at the time. I didn't have a home anymore, and all the local places just made me think of my folks. If I was going to start over and start fresh, it couldn't be there. Wow, that's freaking dark. Okay, well, I'm sorry that happened, and now I wish I never met you. Uh, thanks? Yeah, you're welcome. We're here. All right, then, Adelaide said, taking a deep breath and exhaling it slowly. Let's do this before I lose my nerve. Desmond could feel the energy of the party the moment he opened the door. This was definitely the place to be. The place he wanted it to be. Everywhere he looked, people were celebrating life. This was about surviving another year in a harsh world. It was gluttonous and lustful, hedonistic and beautiful. He twirled and danced as he entered. The beat and vibration of the bass-filled music coursed through his body. It reminded him of the beginning, of the day he tasted true life for the first time. He was so grateful to Mariah for taking him, for showing him all that he was missing. It wasn't New Year's then, it was a couple of months later on St. Patrick's Day. They met at a bar. He was drinking green beer out of a barrel mug with a crude steel handle, and she just sauntered up and kissed him without warning, forever changing his life. It was so long ago. He wondered sometimes where she was now. Desmond smirked at the people doing lines off the coffee table. He laughed and said, Enough of that, and you won't be celebrating next year. They gave him the finger, and he laughed again. He danced his way to the kitchen for a beverage. There was a collection of red plastic cups, markers to write your name on them, and an array of liquor bottles to fill them with. Desmond sang to himself and shook his hips as he worked on a mixed drink. Nearby, there was a guy aggressively having sex with a woman who sat on the counter. A package of cookies crunched under her rear as they gyrated. Together, they moaned, completely uncaring of who saw or heard. Desmond loved it. He loved when people weren't afraid, when they were allowed to be themselves, to feel. 
Now, all he needed to do was find the one he was looking for. They had to be here somewhere. Desmond sipped his drink, licked the wetness from his lips, and slipped onto the dance floor. Laura opened the door and ushered Adelaide into the party. Her nerves increased when she stepped across the threshold. This place was nuts. People were doing drugs and having sex everywhere. It definitely wasn't her scene. Adelaide preferred to hang out in a coffee shop with weird acoustic versions of popular songs crooning above and strangers deep in thought about their next chess move. Still, she needed to be here tonight. This was important, and she reminded herself of that as she awkwardly swayed and nodded to the music. When she turned, Laura was buying a pill off of somebody. Want one? It's on me, she said when she noticed Adelaide looking. Nah, I'm good. Laura twirled back over to her as she popped the pill in her mouth with a giggle. Well, what do you want, she asked. It's New Year's, girl. You're supposed to live it up. Adelaide chewed in her lip and surveyed the chaotic room. Then she pointed at an elegant-looking man in a fine suit that stood out for the crowd. He was sipping on a drink, eyes closed and swaying peacefully to the music by himself. Him, she said, pointing. I want him. There you go. That's my girl, Laura said. She slapped Adelaide on the back. I'm going to go find my own. Adelaide gave a nervous laugh and started towards the man. She tripped and yelped. When she looked down, she realized two sweaty people with extremely dilated pupils were going at it on the floor. She chuckled to herself and carefully stepped over them. When she looked up again, she found the man she was headed towards smiling at her, eyes open. Adelaide flushed. Uh, Hi, she said shyly. I'm Adelaide. Hello, my dear. Desmond. I knew I'd find you, or you would find me eventually. Oh? Adelaide gave a shy chuckle. Yes, I've been searching for the right person since I got here. Looked to me like you were just dancing and maybe contemplative. He laughed. Sometimes it works best to let people find me. You know the old saying, when you stop looking is when you find what you're looking for. Or in my case, who? So... Who exactly are you looking for, she asked, studying him intently. And when I plan to kiss at midnight. Oh, (laughs) Adelaide said with a laugh. Yeah, that sounds nice. Seems like a lot of people here couldn't be bothered to wait for midnight. She laughed again, though it sounded more nervous than genuine. Yes, he said with a laugh of his own. I applaud those people, but I'm not one of them. I like to savor the little things, to stick to my patterns. Every year I search for the right party and the right person. How do you know when you've found them? I just know. Then we dance, we talk, we enjoy each other's company, and at midnight we bring in the new year with a kiss, and it starts everything off right. It's a ritual that hasn't failed me yet. Well, then, I believe you're exactly who I'm looking for, too. How? How so? Adelaide chewed her lip and let her gaze linger on his chestnut eyes. The gesture was less anxious and more sensual now. I just moved here, she told him as she took his hands. I've been in kind of a shell. I wanted to experience something, to live a little, you know? But, eh, not quite as much as some of these people. Desmond laughed. I understand perfectly. And I'm glad we found each other. Let's dance. Okay, she said, her shyness returning. Adelaide led Desmond lead her out onto the dance floor. The music was so loud she could feel it in her bones, but she grinned and did her best to move to the rhythm. He matched her expression, released her hands, and started demonstrating his moves. You're good, she told him. Well, I've had a lot of practice, he said, practically shouting to be heard over the music. I have not, she said with a laugh, leaning over by his ear. That's all right, he said back, taking her in his arms and twirling her. She rolled away for him with an excited yelp and then spun back like a child's yo-yo. When she returned to his arms and his contagious smile, he said, Tonight's just the beginning. The New Year starts at midnight. There'll be plenty of time to learn. Are you volunteering to teach me? 
Adelaide asked, her tone eager. I will gladly teach you many things, he said back, dipping her and letting her gaze linger on hers before picking her back up. You're equally exciting and frightening, she told him. Just like life, he said back. Well, I suppose. When the song ended and there was a moment before the next began, he said, I notice you don't have a drink. Let's hit the kitchen. Not like those two other on the counter I could see through the doorway, though. Adelaide said with a laugh, Just for a drink, and you can fix it yourself so you know it's safe. Actually, I hadn't even thought about being worried about it, so thanks for putting that in my head. My apologies, Desmond said. He took her hand and led her through the laughing, cheering, kissing, smoking, dancing partygoers. She found herself thinking that a drink was actually probably a good idea. Several wouldn't be, but one would just take the edge off and loosen her up a bit, calm her, and steal her nerves. It would allow her to do what she needed to do here tonight. Desmond waved an arm at the bottle selection. What will you choose, he asked, with what seemed like genuine curiosity. I'm a vodka girl, she said, although I hate it straight. She picked up several vodka bottles inside when each was empty. Looks like you won't be a vodka girl tonight, Desmond said. What's second place? Adelaide picked up a bottle of spiced rum. She wasn't fond of the stuff, but it made her think of her father. He was more than fond of it. She missed him more than she had words for. She didn't bother with a cup, turned the bottle up, swishing down brown liquid into her mouth. Whoa, easy there, Desmond said. I'm fine. Live a little. It's New Year's Eve, she said, winking. Desmond laughed. I knew you were the right one. Just hope I'm a good kisser, she said. I'm out of practice. I'm sure you'll do just fine, he told her. He ran the back of a finger over her cheek. Adelaide shivered and shook it off. So let's talk some, get to know each other before we're locking lips. I'd love that. Desmond led Adelaide out the back door. There were people making out on the porch, but they were obviously not as exhibitionist as some of the other party goers, because they stopped and ran off when they were no longer alone. Ah, to be young, Desmond said, motioning to a now empty seat. Hey, I'm not, like, old, Adelaide said, sitting down. I'm not even 30. I just mean young people are so carefree. They know how to live, to enjoy life. Somehow you humans we lose that as we age. And some of us just enjoy being reckless and a little more laid back. Fair enough. Tell me more about yourself, then. Let me get to know you. And so she did. They talked for over an hour, the raucous party booming on the other side of the wall. It was like two different worlds, the chaos of the wild bringing in the new year and the subtle, quiet song of the crickets on a starry night where they sat. Are you not cold? Desmond asked her. I'm all right. Inside, chanting began. Both Desmond and Adelaide realized they were counting. I guess it's time, she said, standing. Should we go inside with everyone? Desmond stood as well. No, I'm all right here. You're the only person I want to be with at this moment. Romantic and creepy, she said with a laugh. But that's totally your vibe, isn't it? Three, two, one, he said. Then he leaned in and kissed her. She met his kiss with equal passion, their lips hungry for each other, their tongues fighting and their hands roaming. While her eyes were closed, Desmond pulled away just slightly and bit his own lip enough to draw blood. Then he licked it with his tongue so the loose blood was swimming in his saliva, and he dove back in for another kiss. When they reconnected, he bit down on Adelaide's tongue, drawing blood. She let out a quiet, mumbled cry as their blood swirled together and mixed in their mouths. Adelaide swallowed instinctively. When he released her, she said, That was a bit too aggressive, Desmond. I'm sorry. You'll forgive me soon. Belong to me now. We're bound. Please, don't fear. I meant what I said earlier. I aim to teach you so many things. I want to show you how to live. With the gift I've given you, you'll be able to feel, taste, smell, experience, enjoying things like you never imagined doing in your life. You're special, Adelaide. I chose you. Save it, Adelaide said, 
her smile falling away. She wiped at her bleeding mouth with the back of her hand. I didn't come all this way to listen to your line of crap. You try to sell everyone. What? She could see the alarm in Desmond's eyes, and it brought the first genuine smile of the night to her bloody lips. You should be feeling my heartbeat, feeling our connection, feeling everything, Desmond said, shaking his head slowly. You should be able to hear the music inside and taste the different elements in the air around you. I'm sure that would be very exciting, but not worth the price, she said. In the house, people were screaming, champagne corks were popping, and ricocheting off things to a volley of laughter. Tell me how. I've been doing this for centuries. Adelaide smiled again, but the gesture was filled with hatred. There was no joy to be found. She tugged on the collar of her dress and showed him the cross and sigils branded into her flesh. I can't imagine that being good for first dates, he said snidely. Who are you? Two years ago today. Maxine? Who was she to you? She was my mother. She was married. She was wonderful and normal and an introvert. Then she was your slave. For a year, my father and I thought she was dead. Then, last year, just before the new year, she showed up back home. My father forgave all our indiscretions because he was just so happy that she was alive. He didn't hit the bottle of rum for the first time in a year. She was moved by his loyalty and made him like her, like you. Then, after a year of watching them become monsters, to drink of people like most do champagne, she was prepared to send him away so he could find his one and spread your disease. I couldn't let that happen, so I waited for the rise of the sun. I waited for them to be deep in slumber, and I burned the house to the ground. After I killed my own parents, I spent a year researching you, tracking you, finding out how to be the one you chose. Now, here we are. What do you want? This. Adelaide reached into her purse and came out with something she threw into the air. Desmond's gaze moved to follow it. It was a deck of playing cards, let loose in the air to flutter like fallen leaves. He realized his mistake at once when he felt the stake plunge into his heart. He looked back at her, mouth open in shock. His hands grabbed at the stake protruding from his chest and he fell to his knees. My New Year's resolution, Adelaide told him in his final moments, is to hunt down and find everyone you made, everyone you turned, and do to them what I just did to you. See, Desmond, you made me as well. I'm the monster you made by accident. And I'm your undoing. Die now, knowing that I'm going to destroy your legacy. You wanted to teach me how to live. Well, allow me to teach you how to die. She pushed him down with her food and then stepped on the stake. She leaned into it with her weight and pushed it down through the bone. Desmond released a single gasp and fell still. Adelaide opened the back door and rejoined the party. It didn't take long for someone to find him and start screaming. She used the chaos to slip outside and make her escape. Laura was leaning up against a tree, kissing some guy. She stopped to turn and look Adelaide's way. How'd it go, she asked. Exactly like I hoped it would, Adelaide said. Happy New Year. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. It's the new year, and what will you be doing this season? Well, while most will be going to parties, spending time with loved ones, or enjoying some quiet time getting some resolutions started, there are some of you out there who might be spending this season stressed, even experiencing what might be called the seasonal blues. Well, I'm here to tell you that it's natural to have those kinds of feelings and stresses at this time of year but it's possible to face them with positivity. If you've been considering therapy to help get you through the tougher times of the season and give yourself the mental toolbox you need to succeed, I recommend contacting the good folks at BetterHelp. BetterHelp is online therapy designed to fit your busy schedule, even during the holidays. 
Just fill out a quick survey and you'll be paired with a licensed therapist ready to help you deal with the stresses that come with this time of year and help you face 2024 with the best face you can. And if you need to, change your therapist at any time for no charge. I can't imagine a better time to start a fresh outlook than the new year. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash horror today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp. H-E-L-P dot com slash horror. I hope you enjoyed A Midnight Kiss by Kisto Healy, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that tale and would love to read more from tonight's very talented feature author, you can help support them by visiting simplyscarypodcast.com slash kisto dash healy. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash c-h-i-s-t-o dash h-e-l-y. Thanks again for your support of this program and tonight's featured author. I guess there are some things uh, worse than spending the new year than being undead. And I guess we just discovered one of those ways, didn't we? But far from the glitz and glamour of the party scene, Dale Thompson brings us the tale of a traveling soul who only wishes to have a nip of whiskey and be on to the next stop. But all it may take to make him change his ways is one very interesting night. Without further ado, I present to you The Weeping Phantom. Perception is not reality. The mind plays tricks. Cadavers have no voice. Shadows are not tangible. The imaginary is not real, and the headless cannot think. The invisible is not seen. Apparitions are not corporeal. Tumorous ghouls do not sing happily. Demons are imposters. Idioms are the ghosts we trap in our minds. The figment of one's own imagination becomes the willow of the wisp, the transparent simulacrum that occupies the space in between. The swarth do not sing, yet I have heard the audible reverie of the disembodied. There is something that glows in irradiation as an evening star is seen in broad daylight. Ghostum has broken through that which separates the living from the dead. The netherworld is not a world outside of our room. We are inside of that infernal region where devils writhe in torment in those Stygian lightless depths and where the fires of shale, mankind is damned and hunted by the worms that die not. Hades never had to rise up to capture the man of iniquity. The earth had lowered itself into the gulf of hopeless desperation. I came to this conclusion after spending a single night in the loft of a church on New Year's Eve, which I was later told was originally a funeral home. I'd walked until my feet were blistered, I'm still unsure why I left the train, that I'd hitched and failed in my wisdom, or lack thereof, to understand why I stopped following the tracks. But deep in the recesses of my soul, I was being drawn into the countryside of dirt roads and little towns. I'd been a heavy drinker in those days, and anywhere I could find some hooch, I dared to enter. I remember that at this time, I had not had anything to drink for a couple of days, and I was feeling the tremors sneaking up on me. There was no more drink among the other hobos on the train, so my inclination was to follow my thirsty instincts and find a town where I might slide into a tavern for a bit that I might wet my whistle. This was always my haven of refuge when it was bitter cold. I may have been a hobo, but I was not financially broke, not at all. I was not impecunious, but I was poor. I simply did not have any barriers, no real compass, and thus I navigated my feelings, sensations, sort of a sixth sense. I was not impoverished nor destitute, yet at times 
I felt that I existed insufficient of necessities. It was like getting caught in a rainstorm without an umbrella. When it rains, does one need an umbrella? Not necessarily. Yet an umbrella does come in handy, but it does not define one as indigent. It could mean that a person without an umbrella in the rain is not as miserable as others might believe. Beggardly or wretched, I have never been, but I have been hungry, and during this moment, which I'm referring to, I will admit that I was haplessly thirsty. I made my way to a very little town. The weather was not favorable. To be more exact, it was less than propitious. A raking east wind was blowing directly into my face. My cheeks were practically frozen, hard and numb. It was dimly lit, the streets were practically bare, with the exception of a stray dog which kept his distance. I suppose I'd be reluctant to race up and lick the hand of a stranger, too, if I were him. I did see a sign ahead from which, from here, and taking my somewhat bad eyes into consideration, I was sure read Saloon. That was all I needed to get back on track. I wasted no time pursuing the nectar that I craved, and maybe I could get my dipsomaniac tippling in. I would have to say, and I must confess, that was a professional imbiber with a yellow complexion, a failing liver, and an unsteady gait, which now I had convinced myself that it was just an act. When I stepped through the door of the watering hole, the merrymaking was underway, and I didn't hesitate to join in. If you can't beat them, join them, I always say. There were only about twenty of us all gathered round, frolicking, laughing with the locals at who knows what, yet I laughed and chortled and caroused with the best of them. These were the high times, good times, and I had not bought a single drink yet. The friendly, good people of this unnamed town were very liberal in their resources, not once asking me if I were an impecunious sort. I suppose I looked just as impoverished as the next working fellow, though I didn't work. The entire joint burst out into a song. It appeared they all knew it, and I pretended to mouth the words, New Year's, another beer. Another day the sky is clear. We drink to blindness for those who cannot see. Cursed is every man that hangs on a tree. Swimming for the morning. Do not, my friend, let us drown. We may not wake till we are raised from the ground. Sing for praise or just make a sound. It is the new year for us. The lost and the found. If you have no money, we'll pour you another round. Sinners and saints, we all wear the same crown. In the drunken revelry, while I was laying low in my perniciousness, another inebriated soul tapped me on the shoulder and, with heavy breath, introduced himself in the midst of the symposium. I'd forgotten what the holidays were all about. Usually I was filling my belly with booze, my lungs with hand-rolled cigarettes, and being transported on the rail lines free of charge to destinations unknown. I'm Walter. Walter Bogart. I told Walter my name, not one of the aliases that I occasionally used when the law was involved. I'm Sam Allen. Good to meet you. I reciprocated with a firm handshake. My daddy always said when you shake a man's hand it's not a contest, but you cannot go fish limp with it either. Is this your first time here, Sam? Walter guided me from the bar, away from the noise with a gentle hand laid between my shoulder blades. Yes, it is. I was wondering if there's somewhere in town I might get a cheap room. I mean, I was used to sleeping in train cars and under bridges, so it didn't really matter. But every once in a while, a man needs a good soft mattress for his lumbar. I do indeed. The motel here has rats, and it'll cost you more than you'll get out of it. When you leave out of here tonight, I would not make it too late. But if you go to the end of the street, turn right... And about two blocks down, you'll see a sign that plainly says church. The pastor has a little parsonage next door. Just knock on his door, and when he comes to the door, you tell him Walter sent you, and he'll put you up in the church. It's a small place of worship, but in the back of the church, 
There was a loft and a bed. I considered how odd this was. Standing in a bar, bibulous on my feet, speaking to a good Christian man who was swaying back and forth, and far from being sober, telling me to rattle the hinges on the preacher's door and ask to stay in a church for the night. Man, if God was not trying to get my attention, I do not know what was going on. Walter had put me out of the mood for drinking for some reason, but I picked up a pint from the bartender, who said he was giving me a good deal on it. I thought I'd better take a little liquid courage with me if I was about to face a holy man. Believe it or not, in all my traveling as a professional vagabond, I do not think I've ever had been offered anything so absolutely ironic in all my life. But beggars can't be choosers, now can they? Before I was able to free myself from my newest comrade, he was persisting to tell me a story. I did not want to be inconsiderate or disrespectful, because I'd never been to this region before and was unaware of their traditions. Customs are sometimes sacred, and cultures must be respected, so I obliged him. Walter was glowing with enthusiasm. He was a man that was hard to say no to. He began a very weird teradiddle, as I would define it, while he sat me down at a table with complete strangers. He goes, one man in, one man goes out. The door is never held. It's always slammed. It's a common door. Nothing stands out. It is wooden, with a neat finish and clean corners. The man that goes in is not the same man that comes out. The man that comes out is not the same man that goes in. Only the man that comes out slams the door. The man that goes in always hesitates before touching the door handle. There's another pause before the handle is turned clockwise. The man on the outside looks around. He never sees a single soul. He's determined to go inside cautiously, apprehensively, eyeing things suspiciously, before committing to the ingress. But without fail, he steps through the doorway quietly and easily closing the door behind him. The door is then locked from the inside. The two men must pass by one another, though neither man encroaches upon the other. Neither one acknowledges the other, and eye contact is never made. Walter spoke clearly, loudly, and had the attention of the table. No one commented or added to his delivery, the entire fiasco contrived, rehearsed, and just plain weird. I was a man who relished in witticisms, but in this case, I found I had no witty reply, nor could I come up with a clever thing to come back with. His narrative had left me a little dumbstruck. I thanked Walter for the story and excused myself, telling him, I must seek out the church, my friend. I am exhausted. I hope you do not mind, but I really need to be on my way. I made my escape. I had a good buzz. My head was cloudy, but not overcast. And I followed the directions from the bar, just like Walter had directed me. And lo and behold, there it was. Church. Miracle of miracles. It really was a church. I admit it was no cathedral, but it looked as welcoming as any church I'd ever stepped foot in. I'll be honest here. I've attended a few churches in my day, admittedly. It was usually while passing through, and I'd heard they were having a community supper, or their soup kitchen was open feeding the homeless. But I've always been respectful, and in times of great need, I have earnestly prayed. Just like Walter had described, the little parsonage was right next door, and I took this opportunity to secure myself on the porch in front of the screen door and knocked a couple of firm times. I didn't want to sound like I was the police coming in on a raid, so twice I gave a kindly knock, non-threatening, docile, friendly sort. I heard a bit of shuffling taking place inside, and then the wooden door opened, and there stood a little old man, a head shorter than myself, and I'm no giant by any means. Good evening. Are you the pastor? I smiled for good measure. I am Reverend Gray. The door opened a tad wider, and he politely returned the smile and said, Happy New Year. I suppose it had been happy so far, so I replied, And Happy New Year's to you as well. 
I wasted no time getting to the pertinent reason I was at his door. I was told by Walter that you might possibly have a spare room I might lodge in for the night. I was hoping I was not being too presumptuous, but I was trying to follow Walter's instructions to the letter. I've learned through trial and error that these things must be done just right, so they don't backfire in your face. Not too formal, as if rehearsed, just true to form, unexaggerated like. Walter, you say? The minister frowned, which gave me a bad feeling. It made me doubt that I'd been precise enough. Maybe something got lost in translation. I was trying to remember verbatim what Walter had said. I suppose I could have misunderstood, or maybe I had read the present situation wrong. Conceivably, I was drunker than I thought I was. Son, I can smell the alcohol in you. And that leads me to the conclusion that you've been invariably drinking with my brother, who must have fallen off the wagon again. The preacher wrinkled his brow disappointingly. Oh, well, he was doing so well, too. Fourteen days straight without that foul poison touching his lips. Honestly, I don't know what I'm going to do with him. I just give it to God. You know, son, you must trust God to sort these things out, especially with family. I nodded in agreement, surprised that Walter was the preacher's brother, worried that if I opened my mouth, I might just put my foot in it. Of course, I have a room. There's a loft in the church that's not being used. It has a bed, clean linen, and you're welcome to spend the night. Do you plan on moving on in the morning? I never really had a plan or direction since I was pretty much a drifter, you know. Wherever the wind blows type of guy. But I said... I should not need more than one night, and I am grateful for your generosity, and thanked him. Reverend Gray disappeared into the dim light of his house and returned with a key, a towel, and a bar of soap. There's a large water basin in the toilet area downstairs if you want to freshen up before bed. Are you hungry or anything? I have some cheese and bread. I can whip you up a sandwich. His Christian graciousness put me under a bit of soul conviction, but I kindly declined. The reverend's voice changed, became more serious, and an octave deeper, and he warned me. Just a side note, son. People have confessed they've seen and heard things in the church at night. Quickly, if you'll permit me to elaborate a story to you, he said cryptically. I thought storytelling must run in the family. First, Walter's inexplicable story, and now I must endure another one. But for a roof over my head, I could endure it. It was a small price to pay for warmth and comfort, and it was not going to get any warmer on this last day of December. The Reverend gave me a quick outline, which was something like this. Many years ago, right after the church was built, there was to be a wedding. The church was filled to the brim with wedding guests, friends, families, and such, and the bride stood at the altar before the preacher, awaiting the arrival of the groom. She was unaware that her honor had been called into question by a jealous young man who, too, wanted to marry the girl, but she refused him and was going to marry another. The jilted young man began to invent stories, creating horrible gossip about the young lady in hopes that her betrothed would believe the rumors and walk away from their wedding. But he was wrong. The bride's soon-to-be husband called out the jealous liar... They agreed to have a duel before the wedding and told no one of this childish event to repair the reputation of the young bride-to-be. On the day of the event, the actual wedding day itself, the soon-to-be groom's gun misfired, although he turned and pulled the trigger first. This left him a sitting duck for the gossiper, who took careful aim and squeezed the trigger, killing the groom instantly in cold blood. News of the tragedy reached the church, and the young bride was devastated, absolutely beside herself. She could not be consoled. I know it's too late to make a long story short, but while still wearing her wedding gown later that night, she returned to the church alone and hung herself from the support beam that ran along the top of the sanctuary. Now, I hope that doesn't put you off, son, but some have said she haunts the church when there are no worshippers inside. The Reverend was finished, and I honestly didn't know what to say. As gruesome and shameful as the tale was, firstly, 
I did not believe in ghosts. Secondly, I was blurry-eyed, fatigued, and played out, and thirdly, I wanted a drink right away. I assured the Reverend that I'd be fine and was not overly bothered by the history of the church. In general, I'm not afraid of anything. I've been in knife fights, attacked with broken glass, been in prison, and bar brawls, and even been shot at once. I thanked him amiably and mentioned that I was desperately tired and sleep was my main agenda for the night. I somewhat lied because I had that pint hidden in my coat pocket and I was dying for a big swig before shutting my eyes. Well, I have breakfast about seven. If you're up by then, you are more than welcome to have a meal with me before heading on your way, he said kind-heartedly. I might just take you up on that, I said, most appreciating the hospitality, but what I was thinking deep inside was, if I drank this pint on top of what I drank already, I would need the hair of the dog to keep me from drifting down the old corpse river. We said good night, and I went straight to the church. Before reaching the church, I heard a bang, as if someone had slammed the door very hard. I stopped my steps, listened, shrugged my shoulders, and ventured on quickly dismissing it, taking the last several steps to the church door. I let myself in with the key and then made myself at home. It was a bit musty, as if the place had been shut up without much attention for a while, but I assumed they had services in the chapel on Sunday, and I was most thankful that the wind outside stayed outside. The church was small with a simple floor plan. There was an open chapel room that could seat about 50 people comfortably, but according to their church board in their last service, the attendance was just 15. I could not imagine that the little preacher could draw in the multitudes with his meek and mild, less than flamboyant demeanor. I suppose that was a good thing in a way. I always thought there were too many posers in the pews anyway. I don't know what I'm saying. What do I know about religion? But anyway, the floor plan was an open sanctuary of the first two floor rooms on either side behind the pulpit area. Then there was a staircase that went up into the loft, which was more like an open attic, and from this vantage point, I could look down from above into the chapel. It was a bit unorthodox. But maybe the building of the church originally was a community built with basic blueprints, and some suggested this loft was a good idea. In fact, for me, on this night, I was thinking it was a splendid build. It gave me a place to lay my head, which was now throbbing. I most likely would have had a real katzenjammer in the morning. Hammered, tanked, call it what you will... But I was not quite there yet, and the pint in my pocket was calling my name. Three sheets to the wind, I said, as I was about to turn the bottle up when I heard something out of the ordinary, which caused me to pause straight away. I lent my hearing to the sounds of the church, but it didn't tickle my ear. Matter of fact, it was as silent as a church mouse in there. No pun intended. I brushed it off, didn't pay much attention to it. These old buildings were full of personality and character. They creaked and cracked, snicked and popped occasionally. Windows might rattle, pipes might seem to vibrate from invisible forces within the walls. They are like the elderly who moan when they sit up, groan when they stand up, and unintentionally burp, fart, belch, and snort in public. Their brittle bones crack and snap, and the toothless ones smack their gums together. It's all part of the aging process, and old buildings are no different. Boy, if these walls could talk. Maybe I'd become accustomed to the clanging railroad tracks, gotten used to the constant roar of the engines, the vibrations, shakes, and jerking, because all this silence around me now was disquieting. This was the first time in my entire life I could actually hear myself breathe. It was deathly quiet, and every little sound seemed to be amplified. I guess I'd never paid much attention to how loud emptiness could be. The painting on the wall of a feminine-looking Jesus holding a red heart with a cross protruding from the top of it was troubling, but I thought, mm, to each his own, I suppose. I remembered hearing about some sacred heart with flames painting, which was to represent ardent love, but I was getting an uninviting impression, and it just put me off. I found myself relaxed finally in the loft. 
The lighting was dreary and practically indistinct, but after seeing that horrendous painting, I didn't feel like I needed to see much else. I simply wanted to lay down, put my feet up on my backpack, and drift into the sublime. I was so looking forward to the mindscape. Once again, I was about to quench my thirst with the pint, and there was that noise again, more disruptive and obtrusive than the first time I'd heard it. It was as if someone was in the chapel and had dragged one of the chairs across the wooden floor. The initial reaction was an acute shudder of my body and a reluctance to give it any interest. I tried to convince myself that whatever it was, a second time, would just go away. It sounded barely discernible, so why bother? There it was again. My awareness sharpened. Now I was annoyed. I placed the cap back onto the pint, returned it to my pocket, and stood to my feet to have a look. This was really putting a damper on my nightcap. The unusual opening from the loft down to the chapel gave me a perceptible vantage point to survey the entire open floor. Whatever was causing the noise was well hidden, or maybe it was nothing at all because I could see nothing obvious. Then again, it was quite dark with only a winter's moon casting faint light through a couple of the windows. The problem with churches is they preach about the light but install stained glass windows which prevents the natural light from shining in. Although I was under the influence of spirits, I didn't believe in such superstitions. I'd seen many things in my days, but never a real spook. I admit that I was conflicted in my condition, which was growing more unpleasant as I attempted to reason things out. I was not wholly surprised that I was a little unnerved after the story from Walter in the tavern, then the heads up from the preacher that I might encounter something otherworldly. Distracted now, I was drawn to the tremulous air of all things around me, and at this moment, I swear I heard a quivering cry. It was weak and faint, yet steady. I imagined it was the outside air possibly blowing through a window seal or such. Vocal swells from high to low in volume and pitch made me greatly wonder. It was lovely, haunting. Lamenting, and although I became forlorn, I was enraptured in its spell. At the same time, I wanted to crawl the walls. There was no time to pick up on, for it was mournful like a dirge, suffering and tragic. Something caught my hazy eyes. This unknown thing was drifting below in the sanctuary between the chairs. It was a thin mist floating, drifting like a puff of smoke that was dissipating but remained constant. I swear this night was becoming more than I expected. I should have been repentantly repelled in horror and wrenched my eyes away, but I found myself glued to it in a trance-like state clearly out of my head. Gradually, the mist metamorphosized into what I can only describe as a snow child adrift in daldom. It was the bride, the capriciously timorous child made my heart beat rapidly. She made a sharp, hollow sound as she came into what I must report looked like a solid, waxen shape. Her white gown was stained red, and the fringes around the bottom were streamers of rot. The lace was making undulating movements as she pranced gracefully around in spectacular fashion. There was something foreboding in her blank, cold expression. I had to be having a moment of severe psychosis. I'd opened myself up to the power of suggestion and had been influenced by the stories told to me earlier. The apparition was marked by contrast. She was pure, but also tarnished. She had never been defiled, yet she was unpleasantly unclean. She was someone I would not have wanted to become personally acquainted with, yet her impurity called to my heart to become a better man. She danced and twirled and wept bitterly. Her feet moved gracefully, and she lifted her refined head and that's when I saw the rope burns upon her pure white throat. She had not acknowledged me, though possibly unintentionally. This bloodless, disembodied angel had captured my impaired eyes, and I was enamored by her radiance. But through her whimsical movements, her deep, painful depression was wreaking havoc upon my conscience. 
She danced alone to a heartbreaking melody I could not hear and sobbed with such distraught shame I could not hold back my own tears. I was enchanted. But then she abruptly stopped her weeping all at once as if by appointment. My heart froze with lingering terror. I was not afraid of her, for as much as she was a horror, she was an angelic as well. Everything was hushed. It was as if the world had stopped spinning to observe the spectacle. With a seemliness that I had never witnessed and a gentle control, she looked directly at me, but it was not to exchange glances, for I could tell she was looking straight through me. My soul felt the touch of her heart, and I ached as a man who had never known compassion before, and who just understood that perfect love casts out all fear. Love was a foreign concept to me, for I knew about the love of wine and women, but this was something much different, and within me I stirred, or maybe her delicately long fingers were churning and rousing an inspiration I'd never known. I wiped cold moisture from the back of my neck and realized I had drooled spittle into my beard. I quickly wiped it away. Something infinitely desolate and isolated inside of me began to fill my heart, and her prescient gaze accosted me, and I became a prisoner unable to resist. I was unable to ferret out what she was purposing, and just like that she released me, leaving me peering into the yawning maw of darkness for she had sunk into the nothingness from which she had visited me. The porcelain-like, delicate, and fragile creature had left me to nothing less than strange shadows and a mind struggling with machinations and the unexplained. I do not pretend that I can elucidate it. I simply could not even speculate it. The deplorable and pitiful in all of her dreadfulness had been the most beautiful thing I had ever experienced. I had lost the craving for the pint in my pocket. Weirdly, I no longer felt inebriated. I may have been completely sober, and this in itself was a miracle, because I couldn't remember a time when I had not been sedated in some way, shape, or form. I may have no longer been soused, but I was extremely tired, and I flopped down on the bed and slept like a child. When I awoke, I wondered if it had been either an alcohol-induced hallucination or a drunken dream. Either way, I awoke afresh, as if I had not touched a drop in ages. I was clear-headed, alert, and not even groggy. It was as if I was a new man. I collected my things, unaware of the time, and headed downstairs. This was certainly one for the memories. What a night. I headed for the door, not the same man I was when I came in. That was without a doubt for sure. I exited the church, slamming the door behind me. This was when I saw Walter, but for some unknown reason, I was not compelled to address him or even look him in the eye. It was an unusually strange state of affairs. He passed by me on the walkway, almost brushing my shoulder with his own without a word, and went to the door of the church. I watched him. He did not turn to look back. He hesitated before touching the door handle. I thought, how curious. He took a momentary break before placing his hand on the door handle and turning it clockwise. I looked around, but no one else was nearby. I didn't see a single soul, just Walter and I, in an uncomfortable passing. Walter seemed guarded and timid. He looked around himself prudently, but never directly at me stepped inside, disappearing, and silently, the door closed behind him. I heard the lock snap into place. He had locked himself inside. I contemplated the words he'd shared at the tavern, and then I knew. I would never touch another drink again, nor enter that primitive mindset. I thought, sons of Adam, am I free? Am I cured? This is when I could smell bacon frying. It was a good day to be alive. I might just drop in on the Reverend and have some breakfast this new year. I hope you enjoyed The Weeping Phantom by Dale Thompson as performed by yours truly. 
If you enjoyed that tale and would love to read more from tonight's very talented feature author, you can help support him by visiting simplyscarypodcast.com slash dale-thompson. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash d-a-l-e dash t-h-o-m-p-s-o-n. Thanks again for your support of this program and tonight's featured author. And more than that, a thank you to all of tonight's featured authors. And even as we forayed into the depths of darkness with tonight's show, we all in the Chilling Entertainment family wish you all the best this holiday season. Now, before we go, I'd also like to take a moment to thank you personally for joining me for this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at ChillingTalesForDuckNights.com, where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs. Or become a patron for as little as five bucks a month. Get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Jiry channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Storytime, dating back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram too. Just search for Otis Gyre. Until next week, stay spooky. Get some sleep if you can. <laughs>
and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Yeah.